Welcome students to the um, second half of chapter 21 about our adaptive defenses. Um, so the kind of innate defenses are the stuff that is always there, always ready for us, um, but the are kind of not specific, right? They're not very targeted, they're very kind of general, um, and they have no ability to kind of be targeted at a particular pathogen. Um, that's where we need um, what I generally think of as kind of our special forces, which is our adaptive immune system. Um, so the adaptive immune system um, kind of implements, uh, kind of supplements um, and can amplify parts of the innate immunity. Um, it can ramp up the inflammatory response. It can activate complement proteins. Um, and really just about anything that our body can be kind of infected with, um, we can develop a, um, an adaptive response to in order to um, help keep us kind of safe and protected. The kind of disadvantage to the adaptive immunity is that it has to be activated. It has to be what we call kind of, kind of primed. Um, you need exposure to a specific foreign kind of substance, a foreign kind of pathogen, um, in order to activate the adaptive immunity um, and kind of get it all ramped up and going. And that takes a little bit of time. Um, so while it's really, really, really kind of targeted um, and excellent at um, kind of taking care of us, um, it does take a little bit of time to uh, kind of turn on. Um, so there are um, kind of a couple of characteristics uh, to the adaptive immune system. One of them is its specificity. So if you get infected with um, E. coli or SARS-CoV-2, um, your adaptive defenses will target a specific part of that thing that has infected you. Um, the other thing that's incredibly useful about our adaptive defenses is that they're, is that they're systemic. So like something like inflammation, right? It's only going to be in that local area, the damaged area. But the adaptive defenses, um, since they're traveling in your blood and your blood goes everywhere, um, the adaptive defenses don't just, they might get primed in that initial kind of target area, but then they can spread throughout your whole body and kind of hunt down and track down um, any remainder of the pathogen. And then the other excellent, excellent um, advantage to our adaptive immunity are memory cells. So once your adaptive immunity has been exposed and primed and targeted, part of your adaptive immunity remains as what we call memory cells. And if you were to see that same pathogen again, um, that same antigen again, then that second response of your adaptive immune system, for one, will kick in faster, um, but it will also be a much stronger response. Um, and, and so by having these memory cells, we're able to respond faster and stronger to stuff that we have already been exposed to. Um, that is basically the underlying premise behind vaccinations. Um, so there are really kind of two parts of the adaptive immunity. They, they, they're, they do overlap a little bit, but they are um, separate from each other, although both of them, of course, are using the lymphocytes. So humoral immunity is so-called because it's uh, what we call antibody-mediated immunity. Uh, the B cells themselves are not like directly attacking stuff. B cells are making antibodies, which kind of target stuff, um, kind of spray paint it almost for other parts of the immune system to kind of get rid of. Cellular immunity is carried out by the T lymphocytes um, and in whilst some T cells are kind of just accessories and helpers, there are a portion of T cells that can directly attack um, an infected cell and so it's cell mediated immunity. All of this requires antigens. Nothing in the adaptive immune system functions properly without antigens. And we talked about antigens once before in terms of identifying types of red blood cells. But really, um, our 
you know, A antigen for an A red blood cell is really only one type of antigen that's in our body. Our body is actually full of antigens. And in fact, all of the stuff that we come across, bacteria and viruses and parasites, they have antigens too. Um, an antigen tends to be these rather complex molecules, very large typically. They can be proteins, they can be lipoproteins, they can be glycoproteins, they can be sugars, they can be gases, they can be all kinds of stuff. But any kind of antigen uh, has to be, um, has to have what we, in order to provoke the immune response, has to um, have what we call antigenic determinants. And so you can see here's our, these are different types of antigenic determinants. Um, when an antigen has these determinants, it has what we call immunogenicity, which means it has the ability to provoke an adaptive immune response. And antigens, no matter what type of adaptive immunity we are talking about, the target for the B cells and the T cells and the antibodies and everything to do with the adaptive immunity, their targets, are the antigens, not necessarily the cell itself or the pathogen itself, but these antigens that they are expressing. Um, so here, you know, you have this particular antigen. It has three different antigenic determinants. So it's going to respond to three different, in this instance, antibodies. Now, sometimes antigens are like a whole complete molecule. Sometimes they might be something that we call a haptin, which is kind of a part of a molecule. We have antigens that are uh, unique to ourselves. So all of our body's cells have uh, self-antigens that say, hey, hey, I belong to this body. Um, and that's one of the ways that um, our adaptive immune system knows not to target our own body's cells, the self-antigens, and to target instead the non-self-antigens. So um, one of the kind of primary types of self-antigen proteins that we have, because these are by and large proteins, uh, although like I said, they can sometimes be sugars and other stuff too, um, but it's, it's usually proteins, um, is something called the major histocompatibility complex, it's the MHC. It happens to be a glycoprotein, so a sugar protein. And each and every one of us have um, unique MHC proteins. Um, mine look different from yours, which look different from your mom's, which look different from your siblings, which look different from your friends. Everybody has their own um, MHC protein. And these um, MHC proteins are part of what happens when we get uh, grafts or uh, transfusions or something, right? Um, mine look different than yours, and so if you were to give me your organ, my immune system would see your MHC proteins, which are not mine, and say, oh, hey, not me, foreign, and could potentially attack it, which is why very often uh, people who do uh, transfusions have to take immunosuppressants to kind of tamp down on their immune system. The other thing that the MHC proteins do is they have this really kind of unique shape in that they have this little kind of groove in them. And this groove uh, can hold another antigen. And that antigen might be your body's self-antigen saying, hey, I belong here. Or it might be a foreign antigen, a part of a, a bacteria or a part of a, um, a virus, maybe the spike protein for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and in order to activate our T lymphocytes, um, our T cells, um, they have to be presented with these antigens kind of held by these MHC proteins. So there are really three types of cells um, that are a part of the adaptive immune system. There's the two lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes, and then there's what are called antigen-presenting cells, APCs, right? Antigen-presenting cells, um, they, they don't have, like, they don't respond to like a specific antigen, but they um, can hold on to these antigens and, and then present them, hence antigen-presenting cell, to, for instance, a T cell in order to turn on that T cell. Um, the one that you see here in the picture happens to be what we call a dendritic cell. Um, and a dendritic cell is a link um, 
between the innate and the adaptive immunity because dendritic cells are part of the innate immunity, um, but they help turn on and activate the adaptive immunity. You'll also see macrophages, one of our phagocytic cells. They can act as um, antigen-presenting cells, and then the B cells themselves can act as uh, an antigen-presenting cell. So let's talk about how our um, adaptive defenses, um, how do we get these, these, these lymphocytes, right? So we start, as with all of our immune cells, in the red bone marrow, right? So we have these little precursor lymphocytes um, that are kind of little proto kind of baby lymphocytes, baby B cells and T cells. Um, so they're formed, they originate there in the red bone marrow. Then some of these little kind of proto lymphocytes will remain in the B cells, in the, in the bone marrow, but some of them will um, diffuse out of the bone marrow, travel through the blood to the thymus. Um, so these are um, the red blood cells, excuse me, the red bone marrow and the thymus are considered primary lymphoid tissues, right? So this is where these lymphocytes are going to mature, where they're going to actually become um, B cells and T cells that can do stuff for us. And what they have to develop um, is really two things immunocompetence, i.e. able to be um, kind of activated, um, and also self-tolerance. They, they, we want mature B cells and T cells to not respond to our body's own antigens. Right? Then we have autoimmune diseases if we, if we don't have that. You, know, we, you don't want your own body's immune cells attacking other parts of the body. We need self-tolerance. Um, so during this maturation process, um, the T cells and the B cells are going to go through um, a, a two-step process to develop immunocompetence, the ability to be activated, and self-tolerance so that they don't are not triggered by our body's own cells. Once we have the mature B cells and T cells, they will seed out to the secondary lymphoid organs and into the blood circulation. Um, so they're considered immunocompetent, but still not activated, still what we call a naive lymphocyte. But they'll seed out into the lymph nodes and the spleen and the pyres patches and the intestines, and they'll circulate through the interstitial fluid and through the blood, um, essentially looking for um, whatever antigen that they are um, supposed to respond to. Now, some B cells and T cells, let's say you're a B cell that responds to streptococcus bacteria. If the person hosting you, um, the person to whom this B cell belongs, never sees streptococcus bacteria, then those B cells will always be naive. They'll never be kind of activated. But if a B cell or a T cell um, does then encounter its specific antigen, then these B cells and T cells will become activated and they will essentially make lots and lots of copies of themselves, so we call proliferation. And then once we have lots and lots of copies of this particular B cell or T cell, the cells will differentiate into an effector cell that's actually gonna do something uh, then and there, and the memory cells um, for that secondary kind of stronger response. For our B cells and our T cells to become immunocompetent and self-tolerant, it's a two-step process. It, they go through what is called positive selection and then negative selection. Um, so the diagram that I'm going to show you here happens to be about the T cells, um, but a very similar process goes through for the B cells as well. Um, Maturation of T cells takes place in the thymus. Maturation of B cells takes place in the bone marrow. But it's still this kind of positive and negative selection process. It's a two-step process. First, to develop immunocompetency, the ability to be activated. And then um, for negative selection, the ability to get um, self-tolerance so that we do not um, have B cells and T cells that are attacking our own body's cells. 
So, um, it, just with the T cells, um, in order for a T cell to be activated, it has to recognize the MHC proteins that belong to its body. So, any cells that can recognize, so any of my T cells that say, oh, hey, that's, that's Professor Gorga's MHC proteins, um, those T cells get to survive. If I have a, a kind of a naive, immature T cell that doesn't recognize my MHC proteins, then those T cells will go through apoptosis, they'll implode, um, and they will not survive that positive selection process. Okay, so now I, after I've gone through positive selection, my T cells um, are immunocompetent. They're able to be activated. But we do not want T cells that are activated by encounters with our own antigens. And so um, you do, essentially what happens is one of your MHC proteins holds up a little self antigen to a T cell and the T cell says, oh, okay, that's us, I'm good. I don't need to respond to that. Or the T cell says, oh, I'm gonna respond to that. And then we have an autoimmune reaction. And so those T cells that don't respond to our self antigens they get to survive. The ones that do attack our self antigens um, go through what we call clonal deletion. Basically, they go uh, and get destroyed. And that's it. Very, very similar process for the B cells. They're going to become immunocompetent first, the ability to be activated, and then they'll develop self tolerance so that they are not activated by our own body's antigens. So this is what positive selection looks like. So here you can see, here is a little antigen presenting cell. You can see here is the MHC protein. Here is our little self antigen. And here we have a kind of naive developing T cell. Well here, this particular T cell doesn't recognize the MHC protein. Well, if it can't recognize the MHC protein, this developing T cell will never be able to be activated. And so that T cell will be destroyed. But this T cell, presented with the same antigen attached to the same self MHC protein, says, oh, oh, this is an MHC protein. I know this MHC protein. And so this T cell can be activated. Um, and so it gets to survive the positive selection process. It has now developed immunocompetency, the ability to be activated. So that's step one. Step two is we do not want this, we do not want T cells and B cells that attack our own body's antigens. So here we have a developing T cell, again, presented, we already know it can recognize the MHC protein. Now we wanna know, does it attack this self antigen when this self antigen is presented by the MHC protein? If this developing T cell attacks the self antigen, um, then um, it will be destroyed because if it is not destroyed and if it gets released and seeded into the secondary tissues, um, then you could have an autoimmune disorder. Conversely, if you have a developing T cell that can be activated, it's immunocompetent, so it recognizes the MHC protein, but doesn't respond to the self antigen, then that T cell gets to survive because it will not attack your body's own antigens and will only respond to non-self antigens. So two-step process, positive selection, negative selection. Right. You know, competency first, the ability to be activated, um, self-tolerance second, the ability not to respond to our body's own antigens. Um, there is a nice table in your textbook, 21.4, um, kind of compares and contrasts the B lymphocytes from the T lymphocytes um, in terms of the um, kind of a branch of immunity that they do, where they mature, uh, their different types of effector cells, um, and some of their targets as well. Um, so this is also another excellent table to review because um, it's a really good compare-contrast table of the kind of two branches of the adaptive immunity.